I was thinking of one kind of vital quality that we need for the last days, uh, because even though we can be experiencing revival and the power of God flowing, um, uh, you know, it's it's almost that something we see in Scripture is that the Lord almost always orchestrates an element of the unknown in our situation. Something we can't see, we can't understand, we can't control. And that's hard for us people because we like seeing it. We like understanding it. Well, like controlling the situation that we're in. And God's very good at taking that out of our realm, so to speak. And, and you know, even though, though the Lord has given us a really good framework of understanding what's going to take place in the last days, there sure are a lot of gaps that he needs to fill in for us that we don't understand how exactly things are going to take place. And we have to trust that he's going to show us and reveal us, reveal it to us in his time. In one sense, God is the God of the unknown. If we knew everything that was going to take place, we wouldn't need to live by faith, would we? We wouldn't need to trust in God. As it says in Hebrews 1, faith is clearly something that's not based on our natural sight. It's invisible. Um, also hope. There's times when we have to just hope in God because we don't know what's going to happen or how things are going to work out. Um, there's, and, and there's times when we don't have a specific word of direction of, uh, you know, even how to go. We're just, Lord, I'm hoping in you for this one. And so we hope in God, but again, hope is, is not something that's tangible. Like the Apostle Paul, he said this in, in Romans 8, 24. He said, for we are saved by hope. We're, that's, that's an interesting phrase. We are saved by hope. But hope that is seen is not hope, right? If you can see it and it's tangible and you have it, it then it, that's not really hope because hope is holding out and trusting that that's going to take place and then that you will be able to get a hold of that. But if we hope for that which we see not, then do we with patience, we wait for it. And so it's interesting, Paul's saying here, usually we relate everything down to faith, but even here he says, we are saved by hope. We're saved as we look to God and we trust in who he is, All right? We can trust in generally in everything he said, but maybe he doesn't, hasn't given us a specific word or promise about the situation. So we don't have that to trust in, but we can hope in him and we're saved by that hope. That hope preserves us. So I want to bring, bring us back to that thought of that in the last days, there's going to be many situations Many uh, trials and experiences where we don't fully know or understand what's going to take place. That can be kind of scary for us as human beings. Uh, but really one of the key necessities of the last days and our day is the ability to place our lives into the hands of God and trust that he's good and trust that he's going to lead us in a good way that his plans for us are good and not evil to give us an expected end. A scripture that was really quickened to me regarding this message was from the Psalms. And it's in Psalm 125 and verse 1. And it says, They that trust in the Lord shall be as Mount Zion, which cannot be removed, but abides forever. As the mountains are round about Jerusalem, so the Lord is surrounding his people from now and forevermore. And this is a realization that God wants to bring us to. That if we'll place our trust fully in him, that he will make us like Mount Zion, which is kind of a profound thought. He doesn't just want to bring us to Mount Zion. He wants to make us like Mount Zion. Now, there's a lot of strong forces in the world, but there's not many that can move a mountain. Right? There's very few. Um, you, you might think of one force that can move a mountain. Maybe if you've, uh, you know, you're old enough, you might have seen 
news of Mount St. Helen exploding and half a mountain <laughs> just exploded and disappeared and it went off to the side. And, you know, I've watched doc lots of documentaries on that. And I don't think watching those can really give you the full sense of what that was like for people who were there and saw it before and then after. Um, but what kind of a mountain is God talking about here? Is he talking about a mountain that can explode or can be influenced by volcanic activity? Not necessarily, because he says, if we trust in him, we'll be like Mount Zion. And this is not the Mount Zion on earth. It's the Mount Zion in heaven, heavenly Mount Zion. And, and how do we know that? Because he says it abides forever. You know, we, we, can, we can look to the earthly Mount Zion that's there in Jerusalem and it's a neat place to visit, but it's not going to be there forever. But heavenly Mount Zion, it's going to abide forever. And God's calling us to be like heavenly Mount Zion. And the way that we can do that, and in reality come to abide in Mount Zion, is to place our trust fully in him. And that joins us to him when we place our trust in him. One of the prime examples I think of, and especially as it relates to the last days of people who had to trust in God and just kind of place their lives in the hands of God, not knowing how things were going to turn out for them. I just think of Daniel's three friends, right? When Nebuchadnezzar erects that image and he, and he you know, says, I'd like people to worship me. That sounds good. And so they, they have to come and bow down to the image as soon as the music plays and so forth. Uh, but this is significant to us because it's going to happen again. Right? We can read about that in Revelation 13, how the Antichrist is going to again build an image. And anyone who does not bow down to that image is, is going to be attacked and uh, he will seek to destroy. Well, how do Daniel's three friends react to this? We can read that, and I love how they react. I just, every time I read this, I kind of smile at, at, at how they responded to him. Daniel 3.16 says, Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego answered and said to the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, we are not careful to answer you in this matter. We're not careful. We don't have a fear or concern to answer you in this matter. Our fear and concern is in honoring the Lord. If it, so, if it be so, our God, whom we serve, is able to deliver us from the burning, fiery furnace, and he will deliver us out of your hand, O king. But if not, be it known unto thee, O king, we will not serve your gods and worship the golden image which you have set up. We are not careful to answer you in this matter. There's no question. We will not be moved. But, you know, at the same time, it's also clear that they didn't have a word from God. They didn't, they, they weren't speak this, speaking this confidently because they knew, oh, you know, God's going to deliver us so we can be, you know, really confident because he's going to perform a miracle. It was clear they didn't know that. They said, our God's more than, more than powerful enough to deliver us from this. But if he doesn't, it doesn't matter. We're not worshiping and we're not bowing down. They fully believed in the power of God to save them, but they also realized they didn't know his will in that matter, whether they would live or die, but they did know who they served. And, and I thought it was interesting how they said, um, even if they're not, uh, he will still deliver us out of your hand. Even if it's by death, we're, we're, we're not under your power and we're getting out from under the power of your hand no matter what, whether we live or die, through following God. They knew who they served, and they were willing to put their lives into his hand and trust in him. Of course, we know how the story played out. I mean, in the natural, it didn't look good for them because the king got really angry. You know, people get angry when you cross their will, especially when they're wicked and you say something, you know, of I'm not, I'm going to follow God and not you. They get angry. Uh, and so Nebuchadnezzar commanded the fire to increase seven times. And uh, they were taken by the strongest soldiers to be cast into the furnace. Those soldiers died. And the, 
and the the three men were put into the fire, but they were not consumed. The only thing consumed were their bonds. They were set free by the fire. And then, of course, one of the most beautiful or the most beautiful aspect of this is seen in what the king said as he looked in astonishment at these three men in the fire because they weren't three men anymore. In verse three, chapter three and verse 24 of Daniel, Daniel chapter three, it says, Nebuchadnezzar, the king was astonished and he rose up in haste and spoke and said to his counselors, did not we cast three men bound into the midst of the fire? And they answered and said unto thee, true, O king, verse 25. Then he answered and said, but I see four men loose walking in the midst of the fire and they have no hurt. And the form of the fourth is like the son of God. They were right to place their trust in the Lord. They, they had to go into the fire, but the fire did something unexpected. It set them free. It burned up their bonds, but not just that. That's where they met the Son of God in that fire. They trusted in God's ways, no matter what the outcome was. They said, okay, we're going to trust in the living God. I'm sure they hoped, <laughs> you know, they wouldn't be human if they didn't hope, well, Lord, I hope you're going to deliver me out of this situation. But they, no matter the outcome, they said, Lord, you're in charge and you're good. And I'm going to trust in you for your deliverance. No matter what the outcome, even if they died in the fire, that was their deliverance from wickedness. So they had to go through the fire. And sometimes God ordains our pathway that it passes right through <laughs> the furnace or it passes right through the valley of the shadow of death or it passes right through a challenging thing. And we say, Lord, and we sometimes, you know, we've been studying Pilgrim's Progress and sometimes we, we see that challenge and that trial right there and then we see a little pathway that bypasses it. Right? Christian had an experience at Bypass Meadow but what happened? He stepped out of the pathway and he came into the territory of the giant despair and was captured. Actually, I'm going to come to that in a minute, but I got ahead of myself. But we can bypass those things. But as Daniel's three friends found, the freedom and, and meeting God came as they passed through the fire. And the king then had instant respect for Daniel's three friends, but it was because he saw that they fully trusted their God. And that allowed the king to see what kind of a God they followed because he got to see him in the fire, you know, that, that he is powerful and that he's alive. And so Daniel's three friends were those who looked to the Lord and trusted in him, even when they didn't know the outcome. I'm reminded of another man in scripture who had this same kind of trust and just put his life in the hands of Jesus. You know, think of, of the apostle Peter. He's the great man of faith. And he saw Jesus walking to him on the water. And, you know, none of the other disciples reacted in the way he did. I mean, you know, they were afraid. Yet Peter, he sees the Lord and he makes this bold request. In Matthew 14, 28, Peter answered him and said, Lord, if, if it's really you, bid me to come out to you on the water. And he said, come. And when Peter was come down out of the ship, he walked on the water to go to Jesus. There's only two people in scripture that walked on water. It's, it's Jesus and Peter. You know, he was a man who had the faith to step out and put his hands in the life of of the master. And so he's a picture of a man with boldness, confidence. Well, we know the rest of the story. It wasn't a perfect story because he looked around as he's walking in a storm on the water and, and he start, you know, his soul started to get a little stirred up. Where am I? And he saw the wind and the waves. And as soon as that fear and anxiety started to come in, he started to sink. And of course, he cried out, Lord, save me. Jesus just reached up a hand and pulled him up and he was standing on the water again. But what I want to bring out here is, is how Peter was a man with boldness, or at least he had a measure of faith where he was willing to step out and trust 
in God. And I, I think that's a kind of a good picture in the sense that sometimes we're worried, what's going to happen if I step out in faith and I fail? Well, Peter did just that. But all he had to do was, Lord, save me. And he was, Jesus was there to pull him up. Of course, we have to be careful. We want to learn from Peter's lesson instead of sinking. And looking at our situation around us and focusing on that, oh, that just causes us to sink, doesn't it? When we look at the wind and the waves and, and everything. But really, that's, that's the essence of trust. Are we going to look at the wind and the waves? Or are we going to look at Jesus, who gives us the ability to walk on water to come to him? When we start to worry and allow concern to come in, we get overwhelmed. And then we have to cry out, Lord, save me. And thankfully, he's there. But isn't it so much better to keep our eyes focused on Jesus, to stand with him in perfect peace? It's like it says in Isaiah 26 in verse 3, You will keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on you because he trusts in you. We have great need of that today, you know, to keep our minds stayed and fixed on the Lord because we're not ignorant of, of what is taking place in the world or what's gone on in the past year, what is taking place. And even though we see those things and there's going to be more things to come one after another. And the question is, what, what are we going to keep our eyes fixed on if we keep getting concerned about what we see happening on the earth where we're going to sink fast. But if we keep our eyes fixed upon Jesus, we can stay standing with him in the storm until he says, peace be still and the storm is over. But we can stay standing with him and be kept in perfect peace. But one thing has to be true. Our eyes have to be fixed upon Jesus knowing and trusting and believing that he will never leave us nor forsake us. One more story. I wanted to, to share it's something that was kind of quickened from our last uh, Bible study of Pilgrim's Progress. And um, we got to the part, as I mentioned, Christian, um, you know, the, the road was hard at one point and made their feet sore. And they looked over and they saw this meadow that was going parallel to the pathway. And uh, they said, well, let's take this. It was Christian's suggestion. Hopeful, Hopeful said, are you sure? Christian said, oh, there won't be any problem. So they got there. And of course, uh, you know, suffice to say, there's more to the story, but s summarizing it, suffice to say, it got dark. They couldn't go on. They lay down and slept and they think, well, we'll get back to the pathway in the morning because they realized this wasn't a good idea. Let's get back to the pathway. Well, the giant despair got them to them first, captured them, put them in, in the dungeon. And it wasn't a pretty sight in the dungeon. He beat them until they couldn't move and uh, didn't give them food or drink. And, and then, you know, after a few days, he came and advised them to give up. Give up on any thought of, of journeying to the celestial city. It's over. In fact, you should just kill yourselves. Just submit to death because they were never going to get out. That was the giant's suggestion to them. And you know that's, that's one of the reasonings of the enemy. Just give up. You know, just give up. It's caused many to you know, maybe not necessarily give up in the, in the natural life, but even more tragic is to give up in the spiritual and to give up eternal life. The giant asks, why should you choose life since it's filled with so much bitterness? You know, Job faced this in the extreme. He had an, a, an extremely bitter season that lasted many months. And he endured well in the beginning, but the more it dragged on, the harder it got for him to stay positive and focused and trust in God. And he considered at one point whether it would be better to choose death than to go on and to continue. And, you know, Christian, it, back in, in the dungeon, you know, the character Christian was, was having the same struggles and was wondering maybe we should just give up. 
But thankfully, he had a companion named Hopeful. And somehow, even though Hopeful had his, his challenges and Christian had to encourage him to do the right thing, but in that dark place, Hopeful, he had that hopeful spirit and he didn't give up. And he encouraged Christians saying he had heard of others who had been captured and then escapes. And, and who knows whether God would, uh, would allow some circumstance that would cause us to escape. And he said, let's be patient and endure for a little while. You know, that's the hopeful spirit that can cause us to endure to the end. As Jesus said, we needed, right? In Matthew 24, he who endures to the end shall be saved. And so that hopeful spirit is one that's so important to have in our trials. And of course, Christian, they were able to get out. He pulled out the key of promise that he forgot he had and was able to open the doors and get out and get back to the pathway. And they were so glad they could. And so that hopeful spirit is something that's so necessary to develop in our hearts. I want to just close with uh, these verses from Isaiah, you know, because I think they show the wonderful power of placing our trust and waiting upon the Lord. Isaiah 40 and verse 29 says, The Lord gives power to the faint. To him who has no might, he increases strength. Even the youths, they're supposed to be strong and you know invigorated, but they will faint and they'll be weary and the young men shall fall exhausted. Verse 31. But those who wait for the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. There's going to be many difficult situations in the last days and in the days we're living in. We've got enough now that we need to worry about the last days and so forth. There's going to be many difficult situations where we will not always know the timing. We won't know the outcome. We won't understand the circumstances. We won't know the why. Lord, why do I have to go through this? But one thing we do know is that if we place our trust in the living God, as Daniel's three friends did, as Peter did, if we'll develop a hopeful spirit and wait on the Lord, then he will surely come and renew our strength and lift us up on eagle's wings to soar with him in heavenly places. And he'll also make us like Mount Zion that won't be removed, but it will abide forever because we are abiding there and we've become like him. Thank you.